This week's episode is brought to you by Harry's. As you know, Harry's founders were fed up with overpaying for expensive razors with unnecessary features. They knew a great shave comes down to great blades made with sharp, durable steel that lasts. And that's why they bought a factory that's been making some of the highest quality blades in the world for over 95 years. And by selling directly to you over the internet, Harry's can offer their blades at a price much lower than the leading brand, just $2 per blade, compared to $4 or more that you pay at the drugstore. Now, Mrs. Revolutions and I both continue to use our Harry's razors. We love the closeness of the shave and the look and the feel of the handles, and the precision trim blade is great for cleaning up my hairline. Now, Harry stands behind their quality of their blades, and they know that switching razors is not an easy decision. So they created a trial offer. You get a $13 value trial set that comes with everything you need for a close, comfortable shave. Weighted ergonomic handle, five-blade razor with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel, and a travel blade cover. If you don't love your shave, let Harry's know within 30 days, and they'll give you a full refund. So listeners of Revolutions can redeem their trial set at harrys.com slash revolutions. That again, H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com slash revolutions. Hello, and welcome to Revolutions. Episode 9.13, The Plan of Ayala. We begin this week back in Morelos to expand on the story we started last week about the many rebellions Francisco Madero faced when he finally became president of Mexico on November the 6th, 1911. The most persistent of these rebellions was in Morelos, and it was now being led by Emiliano Zapata. And though Madero himself, and every historian since, correctly laid the blame for this continued rebellion in Morelos on the reactionary army officers like General Huerta, who seemed to be pursuing their own agendas, It's also clear that President Madero bungled bringing Zapata in from the cold now that he finally had executive authority. A similar story was playing out in the north, where Madero also badly bungled his relationship with Pascual Orozco, and so, as we saw last week, drove the most effective Maderista general of them all back into rebellion. For some reason, Madero's indomitable faith was now being placed not with his old friends, but with his old enemies. It was a huge reason Mexico refused to stabilize in 1912, and it was a huge reason Madero's life is a tragedy rather than a triumph. So to jump back into Morelos, remember that in the period in 1911, when Madero was not quite yet president, the federal troops, led by General Victoriano Huerta, were aggressively hounding the Morelos revolutionaries until they were forced back into, well, revolution. Despite Madero and Zapata coming to an agreement, and Zapata demobilizing his forces, mostly. Huerta aggressively advanced anyway, and Zapata was forced to flee with a small entourage into the mountainous borderlands. From this new headquarters, Zapata restarted his revolutionary movement. Now, aside from Huerta's conduct, one of Zapata's main beefs was that in October of 1911, the governorship of Morelos was handed to Ambrosio Figueroa. The ambitious Figueroa brothers had already tried to kill Zapata a couple of times now, and they continued to treat Morelos as something of a family colony. Their first acquisition in what they figured would be a triumphant post-revolutionary career running south-central Mexico, and then, hopefully, all of Mexico. They had cut deals with the powerful Asandados to protect their interests, and they were in satisfactory alliance, if not outright agreement, with General Huerta. And combined, the Figueroa's authority over the local police, combined with General Huerta's authority over the federal army troops, created a powerful anti-Zapatista coalition. So by the time the election came around in October of 1911, it looked like Zapata and his few remaining allies were boxed in and had nowhere to go. But remember our old Revolutions podcast adage, that yesterday's civilian becomes tomorrow's insurgent thanks to today's atrocity. And this is Morelos in a nutshell. General Huerta continued to rampage around trying to capture Zapata and break the last vestiges of rebellion, and instead he breathed new life into that rebellion. And Zapata himself was not feeling boxed in at all. In fact, he was playing a little bit of calculated rope-a-dope. He and his still fairly small crew backed away and retreated as Huerta continued to come after them. They moved southeast, they crossed the state lines, and were now in the neighboring state of Puebla. Huerta, sensing blood in the water, kept charging, apparently never considering that he was not chasing prey so much as being lured into a trap. And once where to cross the state border, Zapata and his men executed a perfect end run. 
With guides familiar with every nook and trail in the region, Zapata and his more than expert fellow revolutionary horsemen rode more than 200 miles through basically goat trails until they reappeared suddenly deep inside of Morelos, not far from Cuautla and way, way, way in Huerta's rear. And they did not stop there. Zapata and his men continued to push north, and unlike Bernardo Reyes, whose ill-fated rebellion we talked about last week, as Zapata and his men rode, they gained new recruits. From a small band of maybe a couple of dozen, they were soon back up to 1,500. And by the last week of October, just after Madero won his election but just before he was inaugurated, Zapata and his army were camped in villages less than 20 miles from Mexico City. This was a huge personal embarrassment for General Huerta, who just a week or two earlier had been sending confident messages that Morelos was totally pacified. For his failure to actually totally pacify Morelos, General Huerta was stripped of his command and replaced. And that, my friends, is the last time we will meet General Huerta. (laughs) I'm just kidding. That's ironic foreshadowing. Now, really, after Madero became president, that should have been the end of the rebellion in Morelos. Even Madero himself believed that now that the election was over, that the rebellion would also be over. He had, after all, engaged in personal negotiations with Zapata for months, and only been foiled by the fact that because he wasn't president yet, he wasn't able to force the settlement that he himself had agreed to. And Madero said as much after the election. In response to the Zapatistas being so close to the capital at the end of October, Madero issued a long statement that said, in effect, this is no big deal. I'm about to be sworn in as president and there won't be any reason for them to be in rebellion anymore. And that all seemed true. On November the 1st, Governor Figueroa, almost certainly in consultation with Madero, issued blanket pardons to all rebels who handed in their guns within two weeks. Then a few days later, Madero was sworn into office, and he immediately sent a trusted agent up to Ayala to negotiate with Zapata directly. These face-to-face talks with Zapata only seemed to confirm the goodwill and understanding from the previous summer remained in place, The deal struck by Madero's agent was that the federal troops would evacuate Morelos, agrarian reform, if not outright agrarian justice, would get rolling, the Figueroa faction, who had just tried to take over Morelos, would be removed, and Zapata-approved native sons would take over the state government. And then finally, the last six months of violent insurrection by the Zapatistas would also be reclassified as a legitimate protest to an illegitimate regime. Okay, so far, so good. But as these talks were going on, the new general of the thousand-man federal column, whose name I won't trouble you with, decided on his own initiative to make sure Zapata did not get up to any funny business. He advanced his troops on Ayala and commenced a wide encirclement. Zapata instantly detected treachery. Now, Madero's agent swore that this was all a misunderstanding, and he tried to race back to Mexico City for further assurances from the president, but even he was now blocked from leaving Ayala. It was not until the next day he was able to slip through the federal lines and get back to talk to Madero to confirm that this was not some kind of trap. But President Madero now adopted a very different tone. Apparently, he was becoming acutely aware of the responsibilities and weight of his new office, and Madero had decided the time had come to be authoritative, if not authoritarian. His only official response to Zapata was that Zapata needed to surrender unconditionally, Only then could Madero, now as President of Mexico, pardon Zapata and begin talks. Admission of subservience to the official sovereign government had to precede everything. Now, in a vacuum, this is an understandable position to take, but in the actual circumstances, this is a very weird hill to die on. Madero is insisting on an abstract principle, but doing nothing to address concrete reality. And even when his agent got back, the agent was not allowed to pass through the lines again, so Zapata only got this official notice. If there were auxiliary verbal assurances the president meant to pass along to Zapata, they never got through. So, when Zapata surveyed the federal troops surrounding him while reading Madero's note that he expected nothing less than unconditional surrender, the reality of treachery and betrayal set in. Madero was the one man Zapata had decided he could trust— and now he was being knifed in the back. So Zapata broke off negotiations and once again slipped out of town with his closest allies. They headed south, back up into the mountains. A few weeks later, Zapata issued what has become one of the most famous revolutionary proclamations of them all, 
the plan of Ayala. If the plan of San Luis was a stirring call for political revolution, the plan of Ayala was a stirring call for social revolution. Signed and promulgated on November the 28th, 1911, it was about to become the sacred text of the agrarian revolutionaries and would continue to be a sacred text of agrarian revolutionaries everywhere right up to the present day. The plan of Ayala came in 15 points. The first and longest was a denunciation of Madero and his treacherous treatment of his old friends. It called for Mexicans everywhere to continue the revolution Madero had abandoned. And then it moved on to say that to lead this rebellion, the plan of Ayala specifically called on Pascual Orozco. But if he declined, then Zapata would take overall command of a renewed national revolution. And what was the point of this revolution? Not mere political reform, but land and justice. Points 6, 7, and 8 are the heart of the plan of Ayala, and so I'm just going to read them in full right now. Point 6. As an additional part of the plan, we invoke, we give notice, that regarding the fields, timber, and water which the landlords, scientificos, or bosses have usurped, the pueblos or citizens who have the titles corresponding to those properties will immediately enter into possession of that real estate of which they have been despoiled by the bad faith of our oppressors, and maintain at any cost with arms in hand the mentioned possession, and the usurpers who consider themselves with a right to them will deduce it before the special tribunals which will be established on the triumph of the revolution. Point 7. In virtue of the fact that the immense majority of Mexican pueblos and citizens are owners of no more than the land they walk on, suffering the horrors of poverty without being able to improve their social condition in any way or to dedicate themselves to industry or agriculture because lands, timber, and water are monopolized in a few hands, for this cause there will be expropriated the third part of those monopolies from the powerful proprietors of them with prior indemnization in order that the pueblos and citizens of Mexico may obtain ejidos, colonies, and foundations for pueblos, or fields for sowing or laboring, and the Mexicans' lack of prosperity and well-being may improve in all and for all. Point 8. Regarding the landlords, scientificos, or bosses who oppose the present plan directly or indirectly, their goods will be nationalized, and the two-thirds part which otherwise would belong to them will go for indemnizations of war, pensions for widows and orphans of the victims who succumb in the struggle for the present plan. And the rest of the plan of Ayala was mostly about how to arrange the government after revolutionary victory. But in total, the plan was an uncompromising statement of social revolution and is rightly famous as one of the most famous revolutionary proclamations of all time. Now, by this point, Madero was also digging his heels in and offering only half-hearted attempts at further negotiation. All he could now promise Zapata was safe passage to exile if the rebel leader laid down his arms. Zapata did not even consider this, especially since just a few weeks earlier, another independent rebel chief in neighboring Puebla had accepted just such an offer, only to be shot, quote-unquote, while trying to escape, which had a long and distinguished history in the Porfiriato as a euphemism for summary execution. To gauge Zapata's new feelings about Madero, I will turn now to a long quote taken from an interview with some government commissioners that Zapata gave, and is republished in John Womack's excellent biography of Zapata. Zapata said, I've been Senior Madero's most faithful partisan. I've given infinite proofs of it, but I'm not anymore. Madero has betrayed me as well as my army the people of Morelos, and the whole nation. Most of his original supporters are in jail or persecuted. Then he went on to say, Nobody trusts him any longer because he's violated all his promises. He's the most fickle, vacillating man I've ever known. When the commissioners asked him what message he would like to give to the president, Zapata said, Tell him this for me, to take off for Havana, because if not, he can count the days as they go by, and in a month, I'll be in Mexico City with 20,000 men and have the pleasure of going up to the presidential palace and dragging him out of there and hanging him from one of the highest trees in the park. So this is the permanent divorce between Zapata and Madero. Zapata, as we will see, can be frustratingly rigid and uncompromised, but Madero bungled this badly. He took the wrong approach. He prioritized the wrong issues. He trusted the wrong people. Emiliano Zapata and then also Pascual Orozco were the two most formidable leaders of Madero's own revolution at the beginning of 1911, 
and he has now alienated them both. The situation in south-central Mexico over the winter of 1911-1912 was precarious. Revolts inspired by the plan of Ayala got going in Puebla, in Mexico State, in Guerrero, in Oaxaca, and then, of course, in Morelos. And this was all very embarrassing for Madero, who, of course, is also dealing with all that other stuff we talked about last week. Things became unstable enough that Ambrosio Figueroa actually resigned as governor of Morelos in mid-January because things in his home state were falling apart and the Figueroas needed to reconcentrate on securing their home base. In Morelos, though, there remained in the state about a thousand regular army troops, but there were also now upwards of 5,000 deputized rurales, federal police officers, tasked with maintaining order and hunting down rebels. But as is so often the case, these guys were confined to the towns and the cities and exerted almost no control whatsoever in the rural areas. But it's not like Zapata was king of the peasants now. The rebels he led were a highly decentralized group. And though this is right around the time that the word Zapatista is really starting to gain traction, it was still very much a loose alliance of independent leaders, each commanding a couple of hundred men rather than some highly organized structure. Now, of these independent leaders, there is one I want to bring attention to, and that is Genovevo de la O. De la O, and that's just the letter O, de la O, was born in 1876 in Morelos. So he's about the same age as Zapata, and also had only ever known life under the Porfiriato. He came from a poor sharecropping family, but also like Zapata, De La O had joined early in the defense of his village's rights and prerogatives against encroaching haciendas. He was well known enough that when the plan of San Luis dropped in November of 1910, De La O was an early leader of a rebel group that was allied with the Ayalan faction. De La O proved to be one of the most tenacious and aggressive of the rebels in Morelos. He conducted campaigns against federal forces that forced them to basically cede whatever territory he happened to be holding, like, oh, don't even bother going over there, that's where De La O is. He was amongst that small group ever ready to hop back into revolt. And after the plan of Ayala revolution began, De La O got even more ambitious and aggressive. Probably hoping to take advantage of government instability after the resignation of Governor Figueroa, De La O launched an offensive that aimed at capturing nothing less than the state capital of Cuernavaca. For one solid week at the end of January and beginning of February 1912, De La O's little army kept up a constant attack that went on practically around the clock. But the rebels never managed to actually push their way into the city. Partly to end the fighting, but also partly to take vengeance on the rebels, federal forces identified the nearby village of Santa Maria as De La O's principal base of operations and they sent up a column, and they burned the village to the ground. De La O was outraged by the destruction of this village, and then he found out that one of his young daughters had died in the fire. He was furious with grief that the Federals had so blatantly violated the rules of war. Now, De La O kept up the fight for as long as he could, but finally a lack of ammunition forced him to pull back. The destruction of Santa Maria was the beginning of a new brutal phase in the conflict in Morelos, because right at this same moment, February of 1912, President Madero appointed a new general to take over the campaign. It was an infamous choice, General Juvencio Robles. Robles was old enough to have fought in the last stages of the patriotic war against the French way back in the 1860s, but he had really learned his trade fighting the Yaqui tribes in Sonora when the federal government started surveying and selling off land that had been the Yaquis since the beginning of time. The Yaqui had been in more or less permanent revolt ever since, and Robles embraced the more sadistic methods of suppression. Remember that during the Porfiriato, there was the old adage, right? Pan o palo, bread or stick. Well, Robles was all stick and no bread. He arrived in Morelos in the first week of February 1912 and immediately started rounding up family members of the rebel chiefs. For Zapata, that meant his sister, his mother-in-law, and two sisters-in-law. All of them were now hostages. Then, Robles ordered the executions of a bunch of captured peasant insurgents. Not leaders, just villagers, the types who were usually amnestied or pardoned. Not anymore. Robles' message was clear. If you get caught, I am going to kill you, not just your boss. And then he introduced a new tactic that had recently been pioneered by various imperial forces in their colonial wars. The British in South Africa, 
the Americans in the Philippines and the Spanish in Cuba. And that was concentration camps. The idea was to take a village that seemed to be a hotbed of rebel activity. You would round up the inhabitants, relocate them into patrolled and possibly fenced camps near a larger city, and then destroy the village itself. Once you had concentrated all the civilians, at least allegedly, any time you went on patrol, anyone you met could be treated as a combatant, and you could shoot them on sight. Now, most of the villagers resettled in these concentration camps, though, were women, children, and old folks, as the men of fighting age tended to flee up into the hills. So, rather than cowing Morelos and beating its people into submission with these punitive and destructive tactics, the ranks of the Zapatistas actually swelled. Now, a lot of Maderistas in Morelos, that is, people still allied with the president, were very queasy about all of this, and they sent back messages to Mexico City saying, I don't think this is such a good idea. But Madero let it all go on, partly because he was more worried about the situation in the north, where Pascual Orozco had finally decided to publicly break with his erstwhile chief in March of 1912. So, for the moment, we are going to leave Morelos and head back north. Okay, so as we established last week, Orozco's bitterness, combined with the overtures of anti-Madero elements in the north, like the Vasquez Gomez brothers, and he went back into open revolt in the first week of March 1912. His first action, which served as his official notice that he was now back in revolt, was chasing off a small army of 500 cavalry, led by Orozco's former lieutenant, who did not follow him into rebellion, Pancho Villa. On March the 6th, Orozco then released a public statement denouncing Madero. But this declaration offered practically nothing in the way of a political or social platform. This is not the plan of Ayala. It was just attacks on Madero, mostly reminding everybody that Madero had abandoned the people who put him into power. The statement also made some pretty far out and, frankly, untrue accusations. Orozco claimed that Madero's revolution had all been organized and financed by the Americans, and that Madero was now planning to sell Mexico to the Yankees, which is, like, not even close to true. He also made much of the fact that Gustavo Madero had submitted a bill to the government for 700,000 pesos to reimburse him for money he had ponied up for the Maderista revolution, while Gustavo was instantly reimbursed, while all other claims, IOUs and debts incurred by other rebel leaders on behalf of Madero, still went unpaid. But that was about all Orozco had to justify going back into rebellion. Anger and resentment at the chief, which, sure, will move some people out there, but isn't exactly the stuff large-scale popular insurrections are made of. Folks are going to need a bit more than that. They're going to need land. They're going to need justice. They're going to need something. But the real problem here is that the guys backing Orozco, the guys who had flattered him back into rebellion, were actually conservative asendados trying to undermine Madero's limited social and political reforms. Whether he knew it or whether he even cared... Orozco was now turning into a reactionary. But at least at first, things continued to go well for Orozco. By the time he sided with this new rebellion, they actually controlled most of Chihuahua, including its most important cities. They were not just confined to the rural hinterlands. And then Orozco won a grim personal victory. With civil war in the north finally erupting, the minister of war, a guy named Jose Gonzalez Salas, resigned the cabinet, and took back up his mantle as a brigadier general to lead the federal campaign. Gonzalez Salas was the guy who had gotten the minister of war job Orozco believed should have been his. That was the beginning of the breach between him and Madero. So it was enormously satisfying for Orozco that in the first big battle at Riano on March the 23rd, Orozco and the rebels routed the federal troops. Gonzalez Salas was so ashamed of this defeat that he committed suicide two days later. And the suicide of Solace was a tragic twist of fate, needing an experienced officer to take over. Lots of conservative military voices in Mexico City urged President Madero to recall General Huerta. Madero fatefully agreed. Huerta was recalled to service and put in charge of the Army of the North. Despite the rebels' ascendancy, though, or perhaps because of it, there was very little unity amongst its leadership. Supposedly, this rebellion was connected to the Vasquez Gomez brothers, and officially, at least, rebel generals like Orozco were ready to recognize Emilio Vasquez Gomez as provisional president of Mexico. 
But these new rebels had even less of a connection to the Vasquez Gomez brothers than they had had to Madero, and Orozco, for his part, never seemed to have had any intention whatsoever to ever play second fiddle to anyone ever again. Nor, frankly, should he have. Orozco had a name, a resume, and connections that made him the real leader of this rebellion. So, on May the 5th, 1912, Emilio Vasquez Gomez re-entered Juarez from his headquarters in Texas, and he was ready for everyone to proclaim him provisional president. Orozco told him to go back to Texas, and if he ever set foot in Mexico again, that he would be arrested and thrown in jail. Emilio looked around, sized up his chances, and he fled back to Texas. And that right there is the end of whatever Vasquista branding may have been attached to this rebellion. It is also the end of the Vasquez-Gomez phase of our story. Now, they would keep trying to organize themselves as the legitimate anti-Madero rebels, and Emilio would in fact be arrested in July for violating American neutrality laws, but they never really generated any support, and national events quickly rushed past them and left them in the dust. Both Francisco and Emilio Vasquez-Gomez would remain in exile, only returning to Mexico later once the revolution was over. And though they did not fulfill their dreams of becoming presidents of Mexico, they did live long enough to die peacefully instead of violently, which is the fate of practically every other person we are talking about in this series. The minute he took control of the rebellion, though, Orozco's fortunes changed. He was never going to be able to match what the federal government was now pouring into Chihuahua under General Huerta in terms of men and money and guns. And it did not help that plenty of old Maderista rebels, like Pancho Villa, were like, no, man, it's fine, give Madero a chance. And a lot of common people felt the same way, and they in fact signed up for federal service rather than rebel service. And Huerta was far more effective up here than he had been in Morelos. At a second battle of Reano on May the 23rd, Orozco's forces were routed and scattered. So Huerta's reputation is beginning to be rehabilitated. He's able to claim these victories and cover himself in some glory. But one dude who would not share in this glory was Pancho Villa. Everyone knew Pancho Villa was a talented officer, but also a dangerous and unpredictable man. So upon his arrival in the north, Huerta attempted to coax Villa into subservience by making him an honorary brigadier general. But Villa continued to mostly be his own man and just kind of do his own thing. He was a bandit turned officer who might switch sides at any moment. So in June of 1912, Huerta found out that Villa had requisitioned a horse for himself from a local farmer, which Huerta seized on as the perfect excuse to get rid of Pancho Villa. Huerta accused Villa of outright theft, and a heated argument broke out between the two men that may or may not have ended with Villa punching Huerta. Accused now of theft and insubordination, Villa was swiftly railroaded through a court-martial that ended up with a sentence of death. But it just so happened that a couple of Madero's brothers were in camp. They knew Villa very well from the good old days and were like, oh my god, geez, we can't let Huerta kill him, he's good. So they sent frantic telegraphs to their brother to get a stay of execution, which they secured and then raced back to Huerta. This stay of execution literally came at the last minute. There is in fact a famous photograph of Villa standing in front of the firing squad about to be shot. The execution was stayed, but Villa was not set free. Instead, he was incarcerated. But it was while in prison that he first met one of Zapata's closest allies, learned about the plan of Ayala, and got some further tutoring in reading, writing, and revolutionary politics. Back on the battlefields of Chihuahua, the summer of 1912 was just one disaster after another for Orozco. The federal forces advanced up from the south, and Orozco had to keep retreating north. Soon, he was pinned against the border with the United States. Huerta retook Chihuahua City on July the 8th, and then, by mid-August, Juarez was captured. Orozco was left with a very small force and practically no hope of winning. In early September 1912, he lost his last little base, and by now wounded, he fled across the border into the United States. His rebellion had turned out to be a complete failure, and he was now in exile. But unlike the Vasquez Gomez brothers, Orozco would be back. After a brief sojourn in Los Angeles, he will wind up making a very strange political bedfellow and return to our story later, representing a very different part of the Mexican Revolution. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, back down in Morelos, General Robles was still pursuing his course of brutality. But the rebels got a reprieve, because with so many resources now being directed to Chihuahua, Robles was forced to work with a limited budget and no real hope of being reinforced, at least not for the time being. The rebels, meanwhile, went into a holding pattern. With Orozco in revolt, they believed it would only be a matter of time before Madero was overthrown, and then they could exert pressure on the new government, hopefully install a more revolutionary government. So though the Zapatistas attacked and raided around in the spring and summer of 1912, things were relatively quiet. The rebels, frankly, needed to conserve ammunition, and then when the rainy season came along, everyone had to return home to take care of the planting, which proceeded more or less normally, because everyone in Morelos whether a conservative or a radical, a peasant or asandado, needed the agricultural produce of Morelos to survive. And so as May turned to June 1912, things almost felt normal. Now this gave the interim governor of Morelos a chance to start lobbying President Madero to ditch General Robles, who was doing far more harm than good. And with the state approaching something resembling peace, martial law was set aside, and the regular functioning of the Constitution was brought back. A bunch of reformist Maderista types, but not Zapatista types, were then elected into a brief legislative session in the summer of 1912 that got the ball rolling on many of the land questions that needed to be answered. Now, none of them had any interest in embracing the kind of large-scale redistribution the plan of Iola called for, but they did introduce a new 10% tax on haciendas to raise the resources necessary to even to begin to start addressing the lines between hacienda and village. Now, at the same time, a new governor's race also got going, and Patricio Leyva threw his hat back into the ring. Leyva, remember, had once enjoyed the support of all the political and social opposition in Morelos, but the family name had taken a major hit when they refused to pick up the revolutionary banner in 1910. But Leyva was sympathetic to the plight of the villagers, and had at least two things going for him that most people seemed to want. He was not just in the pocket of the Asentados, and he was a native son of Morelos. With things continuing to trend towards reform and peace, Madero finally heeded the calls to replace General Robles, and he appointed a new, new, new general. This would be the fourth new general in less than a year. This guy's name is General Felipe Ángeles. Ángeles was as ambitious as any officer in the army, but he had a diametrically opposed worldview to men like Huerta and Robles, who thought that the answer to social unrest was to beat that social unrest into the ground and then shoot it in the back of the head. Angelis came to Morelos intending to strategically play good cop to Robles and Huerta's bad cop. The first thing he did was free the various family members who had been taken hostage. He told them to go home and be at peace. Then he ended the cruel practice of the concentration camps. Now, he could not undo the damage that had been done, but he could prevent more damage from being done. Then he intentionally restricted the scope and movement of his troops. Where the standing assumption under General Robles was that everyone was a rebel and this was a war practically against the whole population of the state, Angelis refused to allow firefights or skirmishes to grow into larger affairs that would make no distinction between rebel and civilian. Basically, he wanted to reduce the violent footprint of the army. And this seemed to work wonders. Both Zapata and De La O later commented that it was at this point, when summer turned to fall in 1912, that the plan of Ayala revolution looked most likely to fail. Men were less willing to return to the rebel camps from their villages. They got less active support from the villages. Then they found out that Orozco's rebellion in the north had completely failed. Had not larger national events overtaken them, it is very possible that the Zapatistas would have dwindled away into nothing and been little more than a historical footnote. Now, speaking of historical footnotes, that's another A-plus transition sentence from yours truly, there is one more little rebellion we need to talk about before we move on. A rebellion that will, like all the others, appear to fizzle away for a lack of real sustained support by the end of 1912. And this is the rebellion of General Felix Diaz. Felix was the nephew of old Don Porfirio. A general in the Mexican army, Felix Diaz had somehow been allowed to stay at his post in Veracruz after the revolution, which is like, I mean, Madero, come on, man, trust me. 
It's okay to not have literal family members of your mortal enemies running key military garrisons. You can fire some of these guys after you've won a revolution. But there, Felix Diaz was still commanding the garrison in Veracruz. Having been in contact off and on with fellow officers like Huerta and Bernardo Reyes, Diaz concluded that if he took the lead and led a rebellion, that most of the army would follow him. But he had even less of a platform to run on than Orozco and the Vasquez Gomez brothers did. Diaz was rising up merely in defense of Mexico's honor, which had been besmirched by the usurper Madero. So Diaz led his men into revolt and took control of Veracruz in the second week of October 1912, and then he waited for the rest of the army to join him. But the rest of the army did not join him. Diaz had not planned this very carefully, and there had never been some organized conspiracy of officers ready to join him. He just sort of went out and did it. So without anyone joining him, Diaz and his guys started looking around and saying, geez, this is not working out, especially because the Navy is also refusing to join us, and they have now instituted a blockade of Veracruz, and so we can't even escape. With absolutely no hope of winning, Diaz's isolated garrison put up no resistance when another army, one loyal to the Madero administration, came and retook the city over October the 22nd and October the 23rd. Diaz himself was arrested, and in a lightning round of court-martial and sentencing that took just a matter of days, he was slated for execution along with 26 other officers on October the 26th. But inside society circles in Mexico City, the railroading of Felix to the firing squad was shocking, especially as Bernardo Reyes and a bunch of Orozco's generals just sort of sat in jail. So cooler heads prevailed, and Diaz's sentence was reduced to imprisonment. But as compassionate as all of this was, the stockades were now getting awfully full of men very hostile to Madero who hungered to overthrow the regime. And every once in a while, I think, you know, treason is treason, and you maybe need to kill a couple of these people so they don't come back. But still, we're now approaching the end of 1912, and despite dozens of violent eruptions and a couple of huge sustained revolts, Madero is still president, and none of these insurrections ever gained wider traction. Even the Zapatistas were at this moment struggling to sustain their revolution. So despite what the various rebel leaders wanted to believe, it turns out there was no real popular clamoring to overthrow Madero. The people of Mexico seemed willing to let Madero have his shot, Certainly, it is one thing to rebel against 30 years of authoritarian tyranny, but this was just a couple of months of a new democratic government. I mean, Madero had just been elected in a popular landslide, so you can't now come around and say, hey, let's rise up and rebel against him. Now, Madero is kind of a disaster of a politician, and a lot of the rebellions against him were frankly his own fault. A better leader could have easily kept Orozco in the fold. A better leader would have had no trouble cutting a deal with Zapata to stand down and then carry out some agrarian reforms to keep Zapata's finger away from the trigger. But even with Madero being this frustratingly obtuse in his dealings, the rebellions of Orozco and Zapata at that moment at the end of 1912 did not threaten his regime. What did threaten his regime, though, was the perception among a lot of people in the officer corps and beyond that these revolts were proof Madero could not govern Mexico effectively. Men like Huerta and Robles and Felix Diaz and Bernardo Reyes fervently believed in the myth-making of the Porfiriato that only a strong hand could control Mexico, that only through strong executive force would Mexico ever be stable. The officer corps of the army was staying loyal to the Maderista government for the moment but most of them were conservative holdovers from the previous regime. And it did not help matters that the American ambassador in Mexico City, Henry Lane Wilson, absolutely believed these same stories, and he breathlessly reported in dispatches to his bosses in Washington, D.C., and to the press that President Madero was simply unable to deliver on the promise of stability. And without stability, there could be no progress. So much was order and progress assumed to be two sides of the same coin. So next week, Francisco Madero will finally face the truly fatal challenge to his regime. It was not a popular uprising. It was a staged coup.